Can I make up a type? So that, uh, so that's going to be the next thing that I'm going to like think about carefully is how do I, I know that I don't want to keep track of every time zone in the world because that's like impossible. I change all the time. It's just a nightmare. Time sucks and computing. It's terrible. Time's not even real when it comes to um, computers. Relative sequence is real, but time is kind of a fake idea. Again, what? Um, so people say we want that instant or we want whatever they're it's relative to them that they're thinking that when you get into concurrent systems especially things like computing where everything's moving at insane speeds um and yet also slow uh the idea of time is it's not really a thing um what's what is the thing though is relative sequence Okay, sequence relative to a given observer or sequence relative to a pair of observers. So that, like, if A sends B a message, number one, and then sends him number two, he always gets one before two. That can be guaranteed. But if he sends, if A sends B message one and then message two, and then C sends B message three and four, you have no idea how A's messages are going to be interleaving with you interleave with um c's messages to be right you don't know you could get three four one two or you could get one two three four or you could get one three four two or whatever right but the relative sequence between a and b and c and b those sequences are relative to themselves consistent <clears throat> um you can kind of, uh, in network traffic, sometimes you can't even have that kind of guarantee, depending on what you're doing. But um, generally, we can we can make guarantees like that, or we can like we can fake guarantees like that and provide those at a cost of something else, usually latency. Um, anyway, bro, I will think about the time zone thing in a little bit. I'll get that sorted out. It, it's just annoying. Um, some so I've been asked a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, so I'm just taking a break from this here to talk about something that's not like in the code that's on the screen. Um, somebody asked, what's the problem with, uh, crypto? Like if crypto is this great idea, um, why isn't it being used, uh, in commerce? Cause I, you know, the retail case is the thing that like crypto absolutely can't handle right now. Why is that? What are the problems in crypto that, that prevent that or whatever? Um, so the there's there's some fundamental problems with crypto um, that prevent it from being used in a, like a, a regular way. Um, some of those problems are the same problem you have with any technology, which is that it's um, it's hard to use. The tooling hasn't been figured out very well and the uh kind of the tribal knowledge that's within the society about how this thing works has not spread out yet either so you've got all these problems at once the interfaces are crappy the tooling around it sucks um most of the blockchains there's a couple of blockchains that are actually pretty good eternity is one of those um but there's not very many that are very good. Uh, most of the original ones that are big and famous actually suck. Like technologically, they're not they're not that good. Um, and the tribal knowledge, like when credit cards were first introduced, people didn't like people understood the idea of credit, but credit was usually lent from like a single store, like a single vendor would put down sales to a given customer on credit, and that was like between them credit cards having like a, a credit vendor which is essentially a trust vendor um aggregating the trust in them from both parties the buyers and the sellers and then enabling a buyer to go with that card to any different vendor and do business that was kind of a novel thing and it wasn't um it wasn't fully understood for a while how that would work and over time we've gotten so lax with them that <coughs> if you look at credit card debt in the u.s right now for example um well, 
people have already started forgetting what credit cards are all about all over again They're thinking that everything can run on credit forever which is not true because everything that things that can't go on forever eventually stop and that's a dangerous you know it's dangerous to make mistakes about that um anyway uh but how credit cards work and if i give my credit card to my kid can they go buy something on my behalf well you know yes and no sometimes um how you know what happens when i do charge something on this or if somebody steals my credit card number and i get falsely charged what do i do like most people today in society know the answers to those questions they know about how long credit card stuff takes to do they know who to call either the bank or, or like visa or whatever to get something resolved um with crypto all those usage questions that come up all the edge cases uh people don't know what to do about them because They've, it's not very well explored. You don't have a neighbor who's used crypto in a retail transaction to tell you how things should play out. And nobody's used crypto in retail normally anyway, or very, very few people have, um, in no small part because no one's written a point of sale system with crypto yet to, and had to think through all the issues, like what are you gonna do if this happens or that happens, or you can't do a chargeback with crypto. You can do a chargeback with credit cards because credit card settlement actually happens like a month late um, or there's always some significant delay uh, but the credit card company also extends credit to the business too so there's there's two sides to the way that the credit business works that makes that like retail credit that makes that work uh, for the vin the buyers and the sellers both with crypto it's much more stripped down and we have to have remedies to um, problems and that's you know coming up with solutions to those problems that's one thing that no like almost nobody's ever explored yet because well because of the big the real problem with crypto which is that people treated crypto like as soon as crypto got hyped even like a little um people treated it like a big ponzi scheme like a big the tulips thing um so we've had the tooling's not good there's no tribal knowledge around it there's no systems that are like built for normal like your average consumer built on it yet whoop let's do it again um and people treat it like a ponzi scheme and then so that's this category of of things and these are like solvable problems we can solve these problems pretty easily there's a couple of remaining problems in crypto that are that are a little bit more sticky because they're tech they're like purely hardcore technical. All the other problems I discussed, the tooling, the travel knowledge, the Ponzi bullshit, that's all uh that's all driven by human behaviors that are either bad or insufficient. And the insufficient behaviors will mend themselves. They'll they'll come up. And a lot of that has to do with doing what I'm doing right now, actually writing a payment system for a blockchain that's fast enough to handle it. Um, once this exists, it'll kind of prove that something like this can exist. And then, you know, you can adopt something like that in an actual business uh, without it being all weird and scammy and, you know, oh my God, they're money laundering. Like, you know, you can allay those fears and comply with like, you know, normal family friendly kind of business. Like the same way Agora does where there is a review process on Agora. You can't just sell like rocket launchers and children and cocaine and stuff on on there that, that won't fly um they, they just won't post they won't let those sale issues be visible like they're just the sale items won't show up um doesn't you know it's like that's the site that's the marketplace's concern that they want to protect their image so that normal people show up because 99 percent of business is like normal commerce is just normal like legal stuff it's not weird wacky criminal stuff um but the fundamental issues like the the fund like the the kind of remaining problems in crypto that make it if you are a technical person you do know how blockchain works very well there's a handful of technical problems that still exist that are sticky and they're kind of hard to to iron out um the one I'm the most concerned about personally is the storage problem. <coughs> the idea of blockchain is that 
everything that goes on the blockchain will forever be stored like everything everything um well you know that's that's okay if you're running at some tiny number of transactions per second and you don't mind it that to sync your chain some user's going to have to commit you know a petabyte to hold your chain um that's a pretty steep requirement that like that excludes most people from being able to to run a node or sync a node if you require like this massive amount of storage or really really beefy hardware so backing down from those requirements how do we how do we have a chain that's fully functional can be researched but doesn't have storage requirements that are totally insane um that's a hard question because blockchain like it's one of its uh sort of founded guarantees is that you should be able to prove that all the transactions were the transactions they claim to be all the way back to genesis right you should be able to you know, proved by the hashes all the way back to the, whatever the Genesis block was. Um, interestingly, uh, I don't know if everyone here watching this knows this, but um, I am a core developer on the Eternity project. Uh, another guy on that project is Ulf uh, Lieger, the, the, you know, super famous airline dude. Um, he has actually done a lot of work on the chain. He spent a lot of time figuring out how to do garbage collection on the chain and in the context of eternity the kind of safe version of garbage collection that he's pursued is to um basically reap or just remove from the state tree the intermediate states so that only the the current states that can that would ever be accessed by a contract call or transaction um only the things he would currently ever need to access are present um which removes like all of the churn all the intermediate churn in the states before that are gone and that saves a tremendous amount of space um on the other hand the penalty that you get with that is you cannot uh like if you've got uh wallet a and wallet b or, or public you know account a and account b Account A sends account B um, one A at height X. Um, if you garbage collect the chain later, then at any height beyond, or I'm sorry, any height before height X, you cannot query the balances of uh, like what was the balance of account A and account B before block height x you can't actually query that and the reason you can't do that is because they've that intermediate state's been wiped out you don't know what it is anymore you'd have to reconstitute it now the garbage collection has a huge <coughs> benefit in terms of saving um saving space uh on the other hand you still have to be able to prove all the way back to genesis so the way that that's handled is all the transactions actually still exist they just have not been played through the state tree so the state tree has not evolved through all those states you're just kind of at the current last state and all the intermediate states are gone which is the bulk of the the memory that you're or not in memory but it's the bulk of the things that you're storing so those are gone but the transactions are all still there and you can still like trace the spine of key blocks back to genesis and if you wanted to you could start back at genesis and replay every transaction and repopulate the whole the whole state tree um and kind of like de garbage collect your, your tree if you wanted to i guess um anyway that's a cool feature that's actually really important for people to be able to run nodes because they don't have like 100 gigabytes or 200 gigabytes or whatever of disk space to commit to running an attorney node. <laughs> however if we uh if I succeed with this point of sale system, for example, or if Agora takes off and everybody uses that instead of eBay, because Agora takes 2% and eBay takes like 20. <coughs> Excuse me. eBay itself doesn't take 20. It's like eBay plus payment processors altogether. You lose like something like a fifth or a quarter of, of uh, 
to sell eBay, which is ridiculous. So it's like, where's the eBay space program? It doesn't make sense to me how much money they must be taking in. But anyway, so we're taking 2% as a service fee. That's a good motivation to go use that. But, you know, mindshare, branding, all that stuff. People don't have AE right now. Um, so Agora probably won't take off right away. But just imagine that it does. If it were to take off and everybody in the world was just using this all the time, we would have a transaction rate that was like through the roof, like, you know, 100 transactions a second, just flying through the chain constantly. Well, they would all be stored forever, right? Forever and ever and ever, which means that, well, we'd have like the blockchain storage would get enormous pretty quickly. Um, like in the course of one year, we would have another 100 or 200 gigabytes of storage required to just keep the chain running and even a garbage collected node at that point would require like 100 gigabytes of, of space just to have the garbage collected version of the chain um well to let that run on for a couple of years right just maxing the chain out like that um and you wind up getting into like the bitcoin size or the ethereum size of, of chain or whatever um and if it keeps going you eventually become like xrp where only people with like these gigantic systems with tons of memory and you know huge amounts of bandwidth can actually run it that's not um that's not the vision of distribution that blockchain's got right it's supposed to be a little bit more democratic than that where everybody can run it if they want to set up a node i'm setting up a node shouldn't cost you a tremendous amount so how to solve the storage problem that's a hard problem it is not a solved problem but i did think of a possible solution the other day um, inside of the Eternity Core team, we've talked about this a few times, uh, the, remember I, I said that the full garbage collection is just kind of the leading edge of the chain, the current topmost state that's exposed, um, or needs to be accessed to actually execute things. Okay. Uh. So all current account balances, current contract states, and stuff like that. But that's that's it. Like all the the path of how we got there is sort of cut off from the intermediate states. But the transactions are all still there. So if we were to close the books at a given <clears throat> at a given block height and say at this block height, we are truncating all of the transactions getting rid of them and we're going to start a new genesis block next and the new genesis height is not going to be zero the new genesis height is going to be the next key block height just like normal but we're just going to break the chain here and call this new open late a new epoch we're going to open a new epoch of the chain here um that would let us garbage collect the old transactions as well and at some point in the chain's history, <clears throat> that just the tail of transactions is going to be bigger than the size of the current chain state. At some point, that will be true. Um, so the biggest one we could get would be closing the books and opening them again with fresh chain state. The gap in this, <clears throat> the, the problem with this plan, is that we don't have a way to garbage collect contracts themselves yet. And the reason that we don't, we can't really do that um, is because we don't have a way to like mark a contract as you can never call me again. And the reason we don't have that is that when you write a Sophia contract, you may write like a set of Sophia contracts and they may actually call each other because a Sophia contract may basically be a library of code that your other contracts need to call. So you may have deployed a, a Sophia contract. It's essentially like a service library, it's the same way you would write any kind of like software library, right? Um, it's just written in Sophia and it runs on the Fate runtime. Um, well, the Fate runtime code is like kept on the chain. So how do you how do you know forever that you're never gonna let anybody else call this contract? That's not a simple problem. I guess we could have like a we could make a pragma like in a contract that says like expires at and then you could put like a block height in or deployment height plus some height i don't know um other contracts that are going to depend on that one at the time they're deployed would also wind up like 
inheriting that constraint that that a given block height they're gonna you know go away to um something like that but anyway you can see this like this is a hard problem and this would require a hard fork to change um not just within the blockchain but within sophia too <clears throat> because this i mean the the light the fate i mean this would be a fate thing not really even sophia um sophia is like in this case sophia is sort of incidental to fate because sophia gets compiled to the to that vm so um yeah so contract actually garbage collecting old contracts that's not a simple thing to do um because we just haven't made a thing for that yet there's that's a pro that's a solvable problem though like i'm confident that we could come up with a way to solve it i'm also confident that not everyone's going to be 100 percent satisfied with that solution um and probably the way to to handle the friction between people that want contracts available like forever and ever and ever versus people that are like no i'm okay with having like a capped horizon on my contract would probably be something like um it would probably cost more gas to store a contract that's going to be there forever versus uh storing a contract that can exist until the end of this epoch that's a good rule actually like at the next epoch if you want a contract to be on there redeploy it that's not a bad rule um or pay a ton of gas up front okay so like imagine that you're gonna store something on the chain but that storage is like time limited by the amount of gas anyway you see where i'm going with this what i'm saying is, is that storage on the chain is expensive because storage like lasts forever you know potentially and you want to have a different price to incentivize people to recognize the ephemeral nature of the na of the data they want to store versus being willing to pay a whole lot to store stuff on chain because they understand that it's expensive to store it but they really need that to be there for um redeployment's not like the worst solution because at the next epoch if you want to keep your thing running you would either pay forward to extend it through the next epoch or not and we do actually do that with um uh, uh aens so eternity um eternity's got like a ton of features that people don't know about one of the features of eternity is it has a name system that's kind of like dns and you can register names on it and then this is actually pretty cool you can register a name on the blockchain and that name is like it's usually like blah 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 dot chain that that's like how it works so you register blah 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 dot chain and then you can assign a pointer uh from that name to like anything so that could be an ip address and then you could change like you can do another transaction to update what the pointer is um but those names they expire after a while like they're registered up to a certain height based on how much you pay when you when you like buy the name it's not like a combination of things like if that name has been registered before or if it's a low character count then it like the shorter names are more expensive and they go to an auction so there's an auction on chain where people can kind of vie for how much they want that name um but anyway in the end is once you get a name you know that it's just like a dns name the timer's kind of ticking down and if you want to keep that name you got to like renew it um it seems reasonable to me to have contracts work in kind of a similar way that you would want to keep track of the contracts you have deployed know how long before they actually like burn out and then have a way to renew them similar to chain names um anyway so i'm brainstorming out loud which isn't really what i'm intended to do with this little segment um but i'm interested in the problem now and i hadn't thought about that the, the fact that we already have like expiring data on chain we've already got like a we have like a a way to do this um and i just never thought about like connecting that to the the contract storage problem um but my, my whole point is that eh, maybe we do have a way to solve the storage problem and uh i mean ulf has already done all this work like really hard he's spent a lot of time and tremendous amount of frustration 
figuring this out. And it's like one of the biggest, most scary problems in blockchain ever is the storage problem. The fact that everything is stored in perpetuity. Um, and that means you could have like full-blown archive nodes that have everything going back forever and you could incentivize people to run those. Uh, and you could have lighter weight nodes that are not just garbage collected, but they're like blocked off by epoch and say, okay, well, the genesis block for this epoch is here. And another advantage of that is if you have expiring contracts, you have this epochal, you know, block where you say, okay, this is the beginning of the next epoch. And you have, con you know, the, the contract ephemerality thing. If that's all true, then you could have much, much easier to run nodes for back end that are still provable to the like they're still directly connected to the to larger history of the chain because that new genesis block is literally the next key block and you can prove that it's trivial to prove that um so so that's a that's a problem that can be fixed um another problem is the uh the transaction the throughput right so the the transactions per second um <clears throat> Eternity has a really good way to solve that. Uh, so, okay, backing up. Why doesn't everybody just use Bitcoin? Well, the, the reason people don't use Bitcoin, uh, which I've mentioned before, is mostly the cost where, like, if I want to buy a bottle of tea and it's like a dollar, but the transaction rate to get a transaction into the Bitcoin blockchain in a reasonable time is like several dollars. Well, it doesn't make sense to spend several dollars in a service fee just to get a bottle of water. That's dumb. Um, in addition, um, so that's one problem is the transaction fees. It sort of prevents, it disincentivizes any kind of use of Bitcoin that's kind of um, like retail level. Uh, you, you could buy, you know, the, the common example is you can buy a house or a car with Bitcoin, but you can't buy, you know, dinner. Um, another reason you can't buy dinner or a coffee or whatever with Bitcoin is that um, the <clears throat> the transaction rate of Bitcoin globally it's supposed to be around like seven something per second seven transactions per second which is still really slow but in practice propagating through the network um, all those messages and all the all the updates and the the, the blocks you know mind blocks going everywhere um, in practice it's more like three point seven transactions per second is what we actually get in practice now theoretical seven in practice it's like half that um you cannot run the global economy on a single chain that runs at that speed that's like it, it's no you could run you could run the economy of a small village on that um which would still have a little bit of pressure at peak time but it wouldn't be too bad um and I'm talking about every transaction. So like every time, every time a kid buys, you know, a bottle of tea at a vending machine, that would go on chain, right? Well, that's a transaction. Um, if the mempool is full and you're only going at 3.7 transactions per second, you've got 100,000 transactions ahead of that kid. How long does he have to wait before the vending machine knows that that was actually the thing that got paid? He doesn't. Um, he doesn't know how long it's going to take. It could take hours, which it usually does take hours. Um, unless you pay a really high gas fee, which gets back to the, the transaction rate problem. So um, so the, the throughput is, is a problem. Again, Eternity's got a good way to solve that. Um, and there's a lot of, bun there's a bunch of different coins that have, have done, they've played with like the speed of mining and the block size and so on, but they're all kind of, that's all like, going in the wrong direction in my opinion um what eternity's done is they've separated the idea of solving the puzzle and mining the blocks so w when you solve the puzzle and you become the leader so you're the new miner right now you can go straight in the mempool and start mining micro blocks right away with the other chains they the key block is the um the transaction log with all the transactions and it. it's all mined all together at once and that's way slow because you got to wait for the next key block to see anything. With Eternity, when a key block's mined, it's like, I've got the, I've got control. 
And so you just start mining transactions right away. So it's ripping through the mempool really quickly, throwing micro blocks out that everybody like, okay, here's the next micro block, next micro. So he's doing all this work um, already while everybody else, all the other miners are trying to find the next puzzle solution so they can take control from that guy and become the miner themselves. Um, which is great. So it's just, it's a separation of concerns between the puzzle solution and the um, ledger update. So that was a like that was a brilliant idea. It's called Bitcoin NG. Um, you can look, go do a search for that and find it. Um, Bitcoin NG. That's like the the principle under which consensus works for eternity. Um, Anyway, so the, those are the two big scary ones. Uh, there's kind of a third one, and that's uh, the concept of like universal value or, or um, regional value. <clears throat> and uh, universal value, regional value, they're actually the same issue because it, it's two different sides of the, of the problem. Um, if I have a single currency for everybody, then the value of that currency um, has two components to it that don't necessarily convert very well across different regions. Uh, one of those is the transaction fee that I was talking about. That transaction fee is going to be constant across the whole world, right? But locally, the value of an item is not constant across the world. Um, it's like the Big Mac index. So there's a, I forget what it's like some bank or research institute or something like that. Um, one of these financial press people, they have, uh, they have a thing called the Big Mac Index. And what it is basically is they're seeing what the relative price of a Big Mac is in different countries. And there are some huge variances in that. Well, you've got a transaction fee that doesn't change. It's universal for everybody. But then you have local values that do change based on where you're at. And that's not entirely stable. So um, sometimes it's good to let uh, a, a given region have a currency that can fluctuate local values with whatever's going on in that zone economically. So it's kind of good to regionalize currencies sometimes. And we don't have a thing to do that right now. So like thinking way ahead, I could easily imagine that... Um, because of a combination of the storage problem and, and the uh, regional values issue, um, if we were to make, like this point of sale system I'm working on, if it takes off and lots of vendors are like, because uh, a lot of vendors already use um, a cell phone or like a, a smartphone or a tablet or whatever at the cash register or even a laptop, and they have something like Square to use credit cards through, um, or they have like a some arbitrary pay system like you know AU like here we have tons of different pay systems that run through phones uh, here in Japan so but then they do like the QR code thing. This is just one more of those. It's just on chain. Um, it's a little bit more real than com the the point values that are just sort of made up by whatever company runs their payment system. <coughs> in the same way that you know most layer two values are actually kind of thick, which is a different problem. I'll talk about some other time because this is getting too long already. Um, anyway. This would be a system that anybody in the world could just register with and say, okay, I want to accept Eternity, uh, register your business, okay, blah, 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 and then you show the QR code and they pay it, and then the this payment backend system monitors the chain and makes sure that your transaction comes through and says, yes, it's paid or it's not, and if you do cancel that, but it came through anyway, it'll do the put it on the refund list so you can, there's no visa standing between you and the customer, right? So it's on the vendor to refund the customer if they double paid or whatever by mistake. So, um, you know, so the system's going to handle stuff like that. But if this system did take off and every, like everybody everywhere was using this, then we would start getting, uh, we would have transaction pressure on the chain. We'd have storage pressure on the chain and we would like run straight into the, the, uh, the universal value problem because the price of eternity would skyrocket initially. And then the worst people in the universe would show up the speculators that like, you know, ruin everything. They would show up and that would spike the price more and then you have like weird profit taking cycles and people would be talking about it all over again you would have the whole scam thing all over again where people are talking about like to the moon and all this other nonsense instead of doing real business they'd be talking speculating on the price of the coin 
which is just going to drive more transactions like in the nowhere space doesn't benefit anybody and meanwhile people just trying to do business are like kind of subject to whatever the price does um until things settle out things would eventually settle out but there's going to be some really wild wild period in the middle um after that wild period if we do have transaction pressure on the chain i think it would make sense to make based on the same same underlying uh the same underlying architecture the same like eternity architecture it would make sense to make regional chains um and then the same way that multi-mining works with uh bitcoin and all the other chains that have copied bitcoin's mining technique or their mining algorithms specifically do you know s switch the miners uh, into a mode where they would be multi-mining eternity-based chains the same way. So you wouldn't lose mining strength across that network. Then you have the problem of fungible problem, you know, fungibility between chains, and that's where it comes, it becomes good to have exchanges between these chains that should be loosely compatible with each other, subject to floating rate changes, you know, between the currency pairs, which is, that's no different than Forex, though. Like, we, we have a model to handle that. It's just kind of, it's like a nut, the next, next, next problem to solve. But right now, I'm just trying to solve the first one that goes back to those original ones I talked about where the the tooling is crappy, the uh, nothing is really, nothing commercial is built on blockchains right now, not really. Um, there's a lot of fake stuff that's built on pretend blockchains that are actually centralized custodial systems, um, which is almost everything that people have actually been using lately is centralized custodial systems that they they promise you we we really really promise that you actually have coins that we could put on chain but we're not going to right now just give us all your fiat and all your coins and we'll just take care of it for you that's what they're that's what they're doing but in doing they're trying i mean part of that's kind of sneaky but part of that's trying to solve these problems i was talking about the storage problem and the uh um the transaction rate problem and, and these other things um so you know to, and the and the fees um if you're just trading like if i give them if i give a centralized ledger <clears throat> custodial ledger system all my coins and then my friend gives them all his coins and then we do lots of trades together but it's like just inside their ledger and then at the end of it they just make one transaction back to the chain all those little transactions we did could be essentially free right because they're, we're not paying the like the gas price for all those transactions because they never happened on chain that's what the custodial systems are doing there's a better way to do that called state channels and we actually have state channels in eternity uh but the tooling around that's like the tooling around some stuff's kind of bad this tooling around state channels is really really bad um but it is sort of the killer feature uh that fixes a lot of this as well so in in certain cases because state channels are two-party uh, two-party systems um anyway this is running on way too long but uh yeah there's pro there's like some fundamental unsolved problems in blockchain and some of those problems have kind of prevented adoption like actual commercial adoption but most of the commercial adoption problems have been human driven like people just haven't done the work to make commercial systems <clears throat> or they've made fake commercial systems and said that they're on chain, but they're actually not. They're custodial, um, or that just didn't. People just haven't gone to the trouble to like, I'd, like until until I wrote Agora. There haven't been like just normal, ordinary sell stuff for crypto. Online, you know, through smart contracts that protect both parties and you know have a negotiation phase and all that um we haven't had anything like that yet so so that was new and then what could go wrong in that that you have to cover down on make sure you're protecting both parties um that's got to be in the contracts and then in the management system and make sure the back end can keep track of that and if the back end of the chain get like desynced from each other how do they reconcile um all those little problems have to be sorted out and that hasn't really happened uh or if it has happened those companies have gone out of business like way early um and it just so everything's been fake like it's all just been oh man blockchain's really potentially great but it's so much easier to just run a ponzi scheme 
So that's what people have done. They've run Ponzi schemes. Um, but that's not a fundamental problem of crypto. The Ponzi scheme thing, I think, has pretty much run, run its course. Ponzi schemes are obvious and silly, and I, I don't see that coming back. I don't think people are going to fall for the same Ponzi scheme twice. Um, so that's good. The... Yeah, the Ponzi thing, I, I think that that's run its course. So I think it's safe to say that, like, whatever the next phase of crypto is, if we can find any commercial adoption at all, then we're probably good. Because I think, like, most of the, like, most of the shit coins are just going to die off now. Now, some of the good coins, I mean, attorney is one of them, have really tiny valuations right now. Um, so if you're just doing, like, chart analytics, you might not know which one's got value and which one <clears throat> which one's got value and which one doesn't because you don't know how the underlying tech works um and you can't see if you're not a developer you can't even see like is it reasonable to build a commercial system on top of this or not i mean it's like just invisible to you so people are trying to make decisions but that's my whole point is that making decisions about a chain based on speculating on its price that's a losing game it's a it's like dumb don't do that um and there's a bunch of reasons to not do that. One of the reasons is that, let's say that you buy a coin really cheap, and then it goes up. It goes to the moon, and you sell off. How are you going to time that and know you timed it right? You can't. It's a, it's a fool's game to play that. Um, and second, even if you do win, if you make out good, and some people have made out good, a lot more people have lost their shirts gambling on crypto. And they were, that's what they were doing. They were gambling. Um, most people who gambled on crypto lost their shirt. A couple of people made out. And the problem with those couple of people that made out was that they don't have a business model. They've got no plan for like what comes next. Their whole idea was get rich on crypto. And if you've ever worked for rich people, which I have, including royalty, and some of them are freaking crazy, um, the dumb ones don't stay rich very well. Like, it's like lottery winners. Like, check up on a lottery winner, like, five years. It, the, you get a lottery winner who chooses to get the lump sum, so, that, you know, they lose half of it in taxes or whatever. Um, five years later, they're usually right back where they started. And it's because poor people are poor and stay poor because they make bad decisions. And if you were somebody who was like not doing very good and you took out a big loan and you bought crypto with it and the crypto mooned and you go, oh, yay, I'm in a lunar cycle and you sell at the right time, which is like almost nobody does because the psychology of that's like, I'm going to wait until it goes up bigger. And then if you do sell and it keeps going up, you're like, oh, I missed out on so much because you just can't be satisfied with well enough. Um, even if that happens. If you don't have a plan for what comes next, then you don't have a business model. And the durable thing, the reliable thing, is to have a business model, not to have a windfall profit. So the people that I see winning long term in the crypto space are the same people that I see winning just in general business. Because windfall profits are never going to be as good as having a business model, which is exactly why Agora is not predicated on uh the price of eternity going up the whole agora business model is that we're you like we don't have credit card compliance issues to deal with we don't have these massive costly audits that happen all the time we don't have a giant fraud chasing system that has to be in operation because the blockchain itself handles most of that so like visa's overhead is huge we don't have to worry about that because the blockchain is the sort of is like the security layer for that um and the personal information stuff we don't have to store personal information because we're just doing like public key checks which are cryptographically secure so there's not like the hard part was writing it but running it's not that hard so we can take a tiny service fee we should be fine at two percent that should actually be pretty good um even if we have to scale up and scale out and all that, we should be able to do that because if we're getting vol the volume that necessitates scaling Agora, then that 2% is going to be plenty to afford that. So I think that's a good business model. 
and it's a business model. We're, we're not interested in the change of the eternity price. We're interested in doing volume, encouraging people who already do real business, like they sell stuff to people online or they make things, they sell it. Um, like the Etsy crap, right? Like that type of group. We're interested in attracting them to do more business. And the more business they do, the better they do, the better we do. That is a business model. And that's always going to win over chasing windfall profits. Uh, and like I said, I think that the, the Ponzi scheme monster that crypto turned into is over. I, I don't see that ever coming back. It's too ridiculous. So when you see all the bots out there, it's always like a Chinese girl or an anime thing or whatever. It's always like cute. You know, look at my boobies. Crypto, buy my shit coin. Um, that shilly stuff shilly stuff it's silly shilly oh that's the dumbest joke ever anyway um that shilling stuff i don't see it sticking around for very long because we're sort of at a make or break moment for crypto and i think you're gonna have a couple of chains where somebody actually builds something that's commercially viable on it and they'll do fine um and then you're gonna have everybody else that just melts away because they were never supposed to be real in the first place um it, it's weird working in the eternity core group because it's like all around us we see these like scam coins and all the, like the, man we've seen so many weird scams happen um on different every different layer of like the crypto game has been full of these like weird scammy people who don't do real work they just like try to find an angle on you but they, they don't know how anything works really it's crazy um those i they just don't have any staying power um but there's going to be a handful of coins that you know have real things built on them and they'll they'll move on and do whatever so anyway that was way longer than i was intending to go off but you know suffice to say there are some fundamental problems with crypto um i think they're solvable like even the storage problem which is like that was the most scary intractable one but after watching Gold's work on garbage collection and thinking through this, I think we could we are gonna actually come up with a solution for that, which is like magical. And if we can come up with a solution for that, other chains maybe can. Um, I mean some of them have got a good garbage collection concept already. So like they've got a strong chance at, at getting there already. Um it's just that the idea of the thing is like how do you close the books and open them again without like screwing everybody over like oh you have to shut your business down and chain you like move your chain thing over to this other i you know does the chain identity change or like what's the deal how do the miners react and there's going to be some tricks to work out there what's the conversion boundary <coughs> but it should be It should be doable. There, there's going to be a smooth way to do it. We just have to think about the details. And the de you know, devil's always in the details, but it's fundamentally a solvable problem. Um, and the people problems mostly center around, around that Ponzi nonsense, and that's going away. The remaining problem is enough people spending enough effort and time doing exactly what I'm doing right here, which is writing an actual business system on top of a chain that not just a chain that's famous, because all the famous ones are not capable of doing this, which is a crazy paradox. Um, but uh, finding a chain that it does have a good enough technology to do this. So it's like you have to find one of those chains. It's like Eternity where the core team was writing a real blockchain while everybody else was writing scam chains. And then like at one point you look around, and you're like, wait, were we supposed to be writing a scam? Or were we supposed to write a real chain? Because we wrote a real chain. And no one's solving these weird problems that, we're, that we've discovered. No one's even talking about them. They're just talking about to the moon crazy shit. So, bah. Silly people um, doing silly things. So, anyway. Blah, blah, blah. Massive digression. Uh, where was I? Time zone. So this is actually...